15 to 20 minutes, we'll discuss a few details regarding the critical care management of the multi-trauma patient in the ICU. My comments of interest in relation with this presentation is none. This is the classic study published by Tranky many years ago regarding the trimodal distribution of deaths in the ICU in multi-trauma patients. As you can see from the bar charts, you can see that the first hours actually uh, are related to the trauma itself. Uh, mortality, the next two to three hours are major attributed to hemorrhage and hemorrhagic shock, whereas two to three weeks later to multiple organ failure and brain injury. Nevertheless, this landmark study was published uh, last year by Van Brigel and colleagues from Netherlands. It included more than 100,000 patients. Uh, it was a retrospective study including patients from at least the last four decades. You can see the trend in the mortality uh, throughout the whole world, actually. You can see there is a slight decrease in the instance of modes of ARDS and sepsis. Nevertheless, there is increased, like, significant increase in the deaths attributed to brain injury and hemorrhage. And you can also see um, this bar chart here, the distribution between different continents. You can see in Europe, the major cause of death remains brain injury in relation with modes, hemorrhage, and sepsis. In Asia, hemorrhage is the major cause of death, whereas in North America is actually modes and no sepsis or hemorrhagic shock. And maybe one of the reasons for these changes in the trend of the mortality could be the implementation of the damage control resuscitation strategy. This strategy includes different components, damage control surgery, the permissive hypotension, rapid rewarming of the patient, limit use uh, of fluids in general, and not uh, actually restrictive fluid management technique, early ratio-based blood component therapy, and correction of different coagulation disorders such as hyperfibrinolysis. The targets of the blood pressure in shock patients in uh, the first hours in the ICU are actually quite modest. The most guidelines suggest a map of around 65 millimeter per mercury in most cases of shock. Trauma patients with penetrating injury, a low blood pressure of 40, until bleeding is controlled surgically. Whereas patients with traumatic brain injury without any kind of systemic hemorrhage, a map of around 90 millimeters per mercury. In any case, hypotension is significant for the diagnosis of shock, but is not necessary. It's actually the science of inadequate tissue perfusion on clinical examination that I have the added value for evaluating the shock severity. And we know from different studies, such as those from Soya that was published many years ago, that exsanguination is the major cause of mortality in the first 48 hours. It can increase mortality up to 60%, whereas duration of hypoperfusion, more than 24 hours, can also have a significant impact upon mortality in this kind of patients. And what we know is that it's not actually the oxygen deficit per se, but it's the, the dose of shock, which is based on both duration and depth of hypoperfusion, because in these cases, even the permanent restoration of surgical anomalies and, and uh, injuries will not permit the cell to be uh, alive and survive the, the stress of the oxygen depth. I remind you the ATLS guidelines where you can see that the blood pressure will be decreased in cases of shock class 3, meaning more than 30 to 40 percent of blood loss. So we have to be prudent about the clinical signs of hypotension in the first hours of ICU patients. And the major surrogate markers for this inadequate perfusion are increased serum lactate and increased base deficit, metabolic acidosis. And the, when these Actually, markers do not get normal within uh, our uh, therapy fluid and vasopressors. This uh, actually means that there was increased mortality and morbidity. We should f don't forget that many causes of hypotension exist apart from exsanguination in the first hours of the ICU. So we need to have a very good echo examination in most of the cases, apart from clinical examination, to exclude cases of hemothorax, uh, pneumothorax, or where we can see the lack of slack sliding, or the, the lung pulse, which are particular signs of pneumothorax. We have to exclude pericardial effusions, and of course evaluate volume responsiveness by different DDSs, as we'll discuss later on, such as the uh, respiratory variation of the maximum velocity of the thick flow at the level of left ventricular, left ventricular outflow tract. Different indices that can be used apart from clinical assessment, such as the capillary field time. There is also a quantitative capillary field time technology, blood lactate, urine output, modeling score. You can also evaluate different resistivity indexes using Doppler echo of the renal artery or the splenic vein. The major problem in the ICU is the so-called level triad, which level triad includes three components, acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. There is an interrelation between those two pathologic disorders. What we know now is that there is a kind of two syndromes, actually. There is a traumatic coagulopathy, which is a primary endogenous immediately after trauma alteration uh, associated with tissue uh, hypoxia, inflammation, a state of SIRS, of systemic inflammatory response syndrome that occurs, will, which this will actually impair uh, synthesis of coagulation factors uh, induces a glycocalyx shedding, platelet dysfunction, 
activation of the protein C pathway, and finally, endogenous hyperfibrinolysis. And there is the itogenic agulopathy, which is secondary exogenous delayed after trauma, which is mostly affected by the vigorous fluid administration, the dilution of our coagulation factors, and in association with acidosis and hypothermia, the so-called level triad can redu reduces the, the activity of different coagulation factors, induces fibrinogen activity, and finally, impaired thrombin generation. In this nice picture, you can see how the endothelial damage attributed to tissue hypoxia and hypoperfusion can increase the expression of thrombomodulin at the level of the endothelial cells, which in association with, thro with, protein, uh, with thrombin will uh, activate protein C. Protein C with protein S will decrease activity of factor 5 and 8, will decrease the level of PAI, the so-called plasminogen activator inhibitor, which is the most essential antagonist of TPA, and in association with hepatic perfusion, the reduced production of plasmin will induce hyperfibrinolysis, which is the major, the major coagulation disorder. Many studies many years ago have shown nicely that the lower the pH, the lower the activity of different coagulation factors, such as factor 10 or factor 2, whereas the low temperature can decrease even 50% the activity of different coagulation factors, such as factor 2. There is, a, there is a linear association between the increased base deficit, particularly the first 24 hours, and the prolongation of the prothrombin time. In this classic study by Brohi, uh, published many years ago, it was shown that the higher the injury severity, more than 30 or four, even 40, the higher the incidence of coagulopathy, and when there is a coagulopathy, uh, mortality increases up to 90%. Uh, there is a debate in the readers regarding how we will assess uh, precisely, all the coagulation factors that occur. Apart from the classic coagulation disorders, we know that there, we have the thromboelastography and thromboelastometry, which is the so-called visualistic uh, hemostasis assays. Uh, there are a lot of literature regarding patients suffering from cardiac surgery or liver transplantation. Nevertheless, according to recent guidelines and different analysis, there's not a lot of literature regarding trauma patients that should justify the use, the implementation of this kind of visualistic methods in relation with classic coagulation disorders. Nevertheless, this kind of techniques can show us the signature of the coagulation factor, can assess level of fibrinolysis, level of fibrinogen, level of pathal activation, and can be of significant value, but it's not indicated as the best available method in relation with classic coagulation factors. I remind you CRAS2 trial, trial that was actually conducting four continents in more than 40 countries and showed in all continents that the administration of tranexamic acid earlier than one hour, or at least earlier than three hours, will have a survival benefit, whereas tranexamic acid administration after three hours in the ICU will not have any effect, any favorable effect in terms of mortality. Classic uh, CRASH 3 trial was published, since we are talking about brain trauma injury as well, uh, in 2019, and included many thousands of patients with mild, moderate, and severe uh, TBI. It showed that only in patients with mild and moderate TBI, tranexamic acid, the earlier the better, could have a favorable impact upon outcome, whereas patients with severe TBI didn't actually be affected by the administration of tranexamic acid. What about the fifth edition, the last edition of guidelines regarding resuscitation and, and, and uh, the treatment of hemorrhagic shock? If we are going to have a plasma-based coagulation resuscitation strategy, guidelines remain the same. We need a PT or PTT less than 1.5 times the normal control and, uh, and transfuse P uh, fresh frozen plasma only in case of substantial bleeding. Regarding uh, visualistic techniques, we can use them to evaluate fibrinogen function or fibrinogen deficit, but in any case, uh, we need the plasma fibrinogen level of at least 1.5 to 2 grams per liter. Otherwise, we will have to administer uh, either a concentrate-based strategy to use either a fibrinogen concentrate or a cryoprecipitate at the dose of 3 to 4 grams. Regarding TXA, TXA tranexamic acid is the same guidelines as used to be in the 20, 2016 publications. Regarding platelets, we need a level of at least 50 to 100,000 per milliliter. In, ca in case of severe traumatic brain injury or severe hemorrhage, we need more than 100,000 platelets per uh, milliliter. What about uh, Novo 7? What about the recombinant factor 8? It, it still remains off-label. It's not indicated in any case of hemorrhagic shock unless all measures, all hemostatic measures we are trying to implement have failed. And the concept is that at pharmacological concentration, this uh, recombinant factor 7 can directly activate factor 10 on the services of uh, platelets. It can induce a kind of thrombin burst irrespectively of the activity and the level of factor 8 and factor 9. Massive transfusion. Massive transfusion, many studies have shown that the higher the amount of RBC transfused, the higher the incidence of MOF in uh, ICU patients. And there is the two-hit theory, uh, according to which the first hit is the trauma itself, and the second hit, which can induce a state of systemic inflammatory response, and the second hit is the massive transfusion, uh, which can also precipitate the occurrence of multiple organ failure syndrome. And there are many different causes for that. I just show you that the, the 
old red blood cells actually release hemi during transfusion, and this hem that is released scavenges NO, so we have a reduced NO bioavailability, which can induce endothelial dysfunction, uh, reactive oxygen species uh, production, vasoconstriction, and activation of different leukocytes. Another term that has been uh, adopted the last year is the so-called TRIM, meaning transfusion-induced immunomodulation. According to this concept, the transfused blood in includes some kind of um, leukocytes that behave as APCs, as antigen-presenting uh, cells, which can induce a shift of the cellular response from TH1, which is a pro-inflammatory, to TH2, which is an anti-inflammatory response, with the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-10. And this can induce a state of immunoparalysis. At the same time, different cytokines that are produced can activate neutrophils through NADPH oxidase or other metabolic pathways, and this will uh, induce subsequently an endothelial dysfunction with potential development of ARDS due to immunomodulation. We should never forget about calcium. Hypocalcemia can be attributed to the uh, blood loss and uh, exacerbated by the resuscitation strategies, which include citrate. At the same time, liver, which does not pro uh, function properly due to hypoperfusion or any other kind of uh, trauma, will not have the metabolic activity to metabolize all this citrate. And this citrate can increase PT, can prolong pro uh, clot formation, can increase acidosis, can induce a security prolongation. And so we have to monitor and treat hypocalcemia. Trally, transfusion rate acute like injury. It's not that rare. It can be associated even to, it can be actually uh, developed in about 10% of the transfused ICU patients. It's most related to transfusion of FFP and platelets, not massive transfusion. And it can induce a state of hypoxemia with increased work of breathing, similar with ARDS, but it's not attributed to volume overload. For volume overload, there's a different syndrome called TACO, transfusion-associated circulatory overload. It is actually an inflammatory reaction mostly attributed to the trapping of the erythrocytes of the donor to the pulmonary circulation of the recipient. So transfusion strategies that remain more or less the same during the last uh, two uh, guideline uh, publications. We need a transfusion guideline of approximately 9 to 10 grams per DL for hemoglobin, a PT and PTT less than 1.5 uh, control markers, uh, 50 to 100,000 per ml of platelets, and 1.5 to 2 grams per DL of fibrinogen. This is out of debate regarding the, the fixed ratio of the transfusion. The American guidelines that was actually based on studies that were performed from the Iraq war in war casualties, with different studies showed that the one to one to one ratio of transfusion of erythrocytes, flesh frozen plasma, and platelets uh, restores blood uh, coagulation and acidosis more early in relation with other ratios. In the last guidelines, the European guidelines have changed their practice and they suggest the use of hypnosis concentrate and RBC or FFP uh, in a, and RBC in a ratio 1 to 2, with a grade of evidence, as you can see, 1C. Vigorous admission, administration of fluids is a catastrophe. Many studies have shown that the over-resuscitation that used to take place in the ICU of these patients induces an intra-abdominal hypertension. And we know that intra-abdominal hypertension can compress ren renal vein and can induce a low GFR, can induce an oliguric renal failure despite the vigorous fluid administration. It can compress portal vein and IVC induces reduced venous return, reduced cardiac output, reduced arterial pressure, more need for vigorous fluid administration, capillary leak, and this vicious cycle will aggravate actually the state of intra-abdominal hypertension and the capillary leak. So we have to do what we know to do in every kind of patient in the ICU, septic patient, whatever. We're not, we need to know at which actually part of the frank Stalin curve our patient is situated. So we can evaluate him by different metrics that are, all, or are currently implemented in the ICU, such as systolic pressure variation, pulse pressure variation, the classic passive leg raising to, in, to evaluate if this client of maneuver can increase cardiac output more than 20, uh, sorry, 10 or 12 percent, or respiratory variation of the IVC uh, and the LVOT maximum velocity. Uh, the concept is to evaluate fluid responsiveness in patients with shock meaning increasing the cardiac output upon fluid administration. If you go to avoid brain trauma, because this is a brain trauma uh, consortium as well, we live in the 21st century, which has been characterized as the century of individualized treatment, individualized diagnosis, and multi-parameter monitoring, where we should monitor in the ICU at, at the same time different parameters that capture different activities of the brain. ICP, brain oxygenation, temperature, glucose, maybe metabolites, and so on. The, cl the classic guidelines, you know, everybody's from 2016, they have not been uh, re-evaluated, uh, suggest an ICP less than 22 millimeters per mercury with a cerebral per perfusion pressure of around 60 to 70. And the new, actually, information is try to evaluate the autocorrelation, the autoregulation status of its patient. In order to do that, we need particular softwares, particular algorithms, but to know the autoregulation status is of most significant in patients with brain trauma and increased ICP. I remind you this uh, nice ghost cap concept 
by Silvia Tacone who suggests the kind of monitoring we need to have in the ICU uh, for every brain trauma ICU patient, the, why, the way we had to intervene in order to restore sodium, oxygen, hemoglobin, glycemia, PCO2, arterial pressure, temperature, and comfort. Uh, immunoparalysis. Many theories know, have shown us that the trauma, that the necrosis of different cells can induce the release of different molecules, the so-called dumps, dangerous associated molecular patterns, which can induce in remote organs inflammation, can induce activation of the filial cells, of coagulation factors, of complement, and so on. And what has been shown is that actually this kind of alteration in the immune response induces shift as well as transfusion, we have already said, of the TH1 to TH2 response, meaning anti-inflammatory response, the activation of monocytes, and so on. And this immunoparalysis can be associated with high incidence of infection two to three weeks earlier, uh, later on uh, during the ICU uh, stay of the patient. I remind you also of the known theory of the loss of the intestinal barrier function due to hemorrhage, which can induce a shift of different toxins from the portal vein towards the liver, activate the Kupfer cells, and massive production of pro inflammatory cytokines in these cases. This is a nice study that was published uh, uh, earlier, one year earlier. It included approximately 70,000 patients from Japan, and they showed that only patients with moderate uh, trauma based on the injury severity score had increased mortality attributed to infection around 50%. Whereas patients who had much more severe injuries with an injury severity score more than 30, there wasn't any kind of difference in the mortality between patients that developed infection and did not develop infection during the ICU. And finally, a study from Ericsson from Sweden, 700 patients. They showed, as you can see here, that the higher the amount of the RBC transfused during the first 24 hours, the higher the odds ratio for post-injury sepsis. You can see here the amount of septic episodes in this box plot that occur during the first two weeks in the ICU. And this Kaplan Mayer showed that actually, in average, there was not any kind of difference in mortality between, of 28 morta days mortality between patients who became, became septic and non-septic in the ICU. Nevertheless, one year mortality was found to be increased in septic patients. And finally, do not forget about the Cuthbertson's classic theory of ebb and flow phase of metabolism, about the early catabolism and late anabolism. What about how can we manage this kind of patients in the ICU? We, meet, we need to feed them. This is the first uh, systematic review and analysis that was published 10 years earlier based on three RCDs that show that early dehydration increases survival, actually, of multidromal patients, not just restoring metabolic dysfunctions. And according to recent guidelines by ESPEN, we should feed early all trauma patients and we should receive all uh, trauma patients receive early and early nutrition instead of early pain, particularly patients suffering from traumatic brain injury, from spinal cord injury, from abdominal uh, aortic surgery, uh, abdominal trauma, or any kind of abdominal surgery since the continuity of the intestine has been secured, has been uh, restored. So in conclusion, our first priority in ICU is the achievement of adequate perfusion and oxygenation using damage control strategy that is based on fixed plasma resuscitation, reduced uh, volume administration, and early restoration of coagulation disorders. Lactate and base deficit, apart from other clinical illnesses, are the best allocated markers we can have in the first hours in order to actually evaluate uh, adequacy of blood perfusion. We need a multidisciplinary approach with different specialties to adhere to evidence-based guidelines and evaluate and monitor at the same time and treat, of course, at the same time all the coagulation disorders that can have a significant impact upon outcome. And finally, potentially monitoring of intraabdominal pressure or even Doppler echocardiography or Doppler ultrasound assessment of, of venous tolerance or fluid tolerance or fluid uh, response is significant for restoring blood volume without inducing a dilution coagulopathy. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we thank Vasilis for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, got a lot of information really fast. Uh, we tried to follow him. Uh, excellent. Um, any questions from the floor, please? Uh, can I ask you something, Vasilis, about uh, the fluid overload? You said that uh, um, we have a patient in, in the trauma center. Uh, we don't have uh, blood yet to give him. We have a massive hemorrhage. We will deal with this patient giving fluids, but then he comes to the ICU, and we still don't have uh, what we need. Uh, and you mentioned in your talk that uh, the fluids uh, uh, could be devastating for the patient. We have. Uh, um, all uh, going out to the third place and uh, we have intentional um, uh, di uh, distension and uh, uh, we have intra-abdominal pressure that is rising. Uh, what do we do in that case? Uh, how do we deal, uh, 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 except of uh, uh, finding out uh, how much uh, 
uh, fluid we have and uh, doing a, probably an ultrasound uh, to realize we need more fluids or not. First of all, we're talking about the trauma center. We have a massive transfusion protocol, meaning there are many different indices uh, in the literature that can tell us, can predict that this patient is going to need a lot of blood to be transfused. So the first priority is to have a very good cooperation between the ER, the OR, the ICU, and the transfusion medicine department to uh, somehow be quick in the, in the RBC transfusion that we need to give to our patient. So by definition, in a trauma center, we'll have this kind of massive transfusion protocol in order to predict which, who, who, who is the patient that actually will need this kind of massive transfusion. Blood pressure targets are modest, as I already said. We don't need to have a normal blood pressure, this kind of patients, uh, uh, particularly in patients with penetrating trauma injuries. Uh, this is actually the concept of the damage control resuscitation. We do not need normal values of blood pressure, normal values of coagulation factors in the first place. We need to be very conservative and try to restore all the surgical abnormalities within the next 12, 40, 24 hours after the admission of the patient to ICU. So fluid administration could have a significant value in patients who are fluid responsive, actually, but will not restore the problem of the hemorrhage, which is the most significant problem, and the problem of hypoperfusion. We have it in our mind as a bridge uh, till we get the blood we need. And uh, my next question is, um, uh, now that the guidelines, uh, the Amer even the American guidelines, they don't have the one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, why do you think that changed? Uh, is it to help coagulopathy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there was always a trend of difference between the American and European guidelines. Yes. Uh, Europe, American guidelines are mostly uh, based on the trauma casualties in the Iraq war. So I don't know the studies they did, how, what, what actually were the casualties, what were the injuries uh, of the soldiers in the Iraq war. It's not the same with a car accident or, I don't know, something to, that happens to a civilian. I think, I suppose, I don't know. Yeah. Any more questions, please? Maybe I have a quick question. You mentioned early nutrition, but can you specify what is early? And if there is maybe a subgroup of patients where maybe we should wait a little bit longer? Early means the first 48 hours. This is what the literature tells us. Only in patients we have uh, loss of intestinal barrier uh, connectivity, how can I say? Patients with significant abdominal injury and abdominal trauma who have not been surgically operated and restored, only these patients have to be uh, based on parenteral nutrition. Otherwise, all other kind of patients, particularly brain injury and spinal cord injury patients due to hypercatabolism, uh, will favor from early enteral nutrition. Okay, I think it's uh, time to move on. Thank you very much Thank for you very your much. wonderful information.